Thank you. Uh, thanks for the invitation to speak today. So I'm a geriatrician, which is a physician that cares for older adults and started my career uh, doing that, mostly clinical work, but over time evolved into uh, trying to come up with a better understanding of what makes older people more vulnerable to getting sick, uh, to becoming functionally and cognitively impaired, and to um, ultimately uh, dying in an accelerated, on an accelerated pathway. So uh, my talk today is both about healthy aging and about frailty and sort of the flip sides of both. So uh, if we think back about 500 years, there was a big search for Fountain of Youth going on in about 1513 by Ponce de Leon. And uh, they found a fountain in St. Augustine. They were looking around in Bimini off the coast of Florida and actually found a couple places uh, based on rumors from some native uh, Caribbean islanders at that point. Uh, they kept looking, though. They went to Naples. And unfortunately, uh, he, didn't, he wasn't very successful because he got shot with a poison arrow and died three weeks later in Havana. So uh, he never made it, uh, even if he found the, the water. So uh, fast forward, uh, sort of what we're doing today is looking for a better understanding of aging and aging biology. And, and um, we think it's crucial to have a better understanding of this because we know that if we, if we come up with the right answers, we're going to be able to fight off chronic disease states in a much better way, uh, ward off frailty or late life decline, uh, maintain resilience in older adults, which is an important new emerging concept and sort of this resistant to uh, stressful events that we see. And uh, again, facilitating a long and healthy life. Most people, older people, uh, it's really what they're looking for. They're not looking to live forever, but they, they wouldn't mind being around longer. Uh, as people get older, they keep saying, well, you know, I'm not quite ready to go yet. Uh, but they want to be healthy and they want to be fit as they get older. So uh, this is a picture of my, uh, my aging role models, my great aunt and uncle. The, the man on the right is my grandfather's brother, Uncle Bob, who lives in Tucson, Arizona with his wife, Wanda. Uh, he's 97 and she's 99. They've been married 79 uh, years now, or 78 years. Um, and so uh, this is from a couple years ago. They're certainly more frail than, than when I took this picture. Uh, they recently moved to an, or to an assisted living facility. Uh, but what they, when I talked to them about what they like and what they want in their lives, they really want to have high energy levels. They don't want to feel tired. They want good health and not being in and out of the hospital. They want to be able to think clearly and maintain uh, social contacts with their friends. Um, they want to do meaningful activities. And they don't want to trouble their kids or their grandkids. That's a very important piece of what they keep talking about. Um, so so that's kind of, that kind of encapsulates a lot of what we see in geriatric medicine. People, um, they want to stay healthy. They don't want to be in and out of the hospital. And they want to be able to do things. So that influences certainly what we do in our program, the Biology of Healthy Aging program at Hopkins. And our approaches in general are not based on a single disease state. So we're not focused on heart failure or kidney failure or Alzheimer's disease. We're focused on sort of the big picture of aging biology and how it influences all of those conditions. So we know that older people, um, as, as they age, are more susceptible to a broad range of illnesses. So we're trying to figure out what, what the basis of that susceptibility is and how, uh, how those processes drive a subset of people down faster. So we look mostly at physiologic systems that have the broadest impact. So again, not just the cardiovascular system or the brain, um, more the connecting systems that, that uh, go across between these systems. And it's, it really requires interdisciplinary team science. So we work with basic biologists. We work with clinical physiologists, with medical and surgical subspecialists, with neurology and psychiatry, certainly, and, that, and increasingly with bioengineering and working with them to figure out solutions for some of the um, issues that uh, we work on on a daily basis. So what we know to date, uh, there are very specific age-related changes that take place at cel cellular, physiological, and at the whole person level, and we'll hear, we'll hear a lot about that today. Uh, we also know that there's great variability between individuals. So like Bob and Wanda are on this trajectory that have kept them uh, long and uh, long living and, and quite healthy. Uh, Aunt Wanda actually has a, had her father lived to be 106 years old, so she probably has some genetics. And Uncle Bob doesn't have those same genes. He's, he's, more, he's been in the hospital more. 
uh, has had a couple uh, illnesses, but uh, as he says, she keeps um, she keeps pulling me back out of the grave and keeping me going. So she's got he's got another sort of um, help there that sort of has kept him going over the years. Um, and uh, disease states, as well as environmental and genetic influences, can accelerate or slow these biologic processes. So this is a, a figure that I frequently use that uh, talks about um, sort of this acceleration towards frailty. So on the right, you see a column that says outcomes. And those are the things that we see in older adults, uh, things that they don't want to have happen to them and are consistent with frailty. We know that the signs and symptoms of frailty are usually weakness, fatigue, weight loss, and sort of slowing down in general. The systems that we think are most important are stress response systems and energy metabolism systems. You see that in the physiology box. And then on the, on the far left, you see specific triggers. So aging biology uh, changes, um, some very specific changes that you'll hear about in more detail today. We know that some genes have an impact. The environment certainly does. Diet and exercise in that middle box there, those all can modify the outcomes. And then chronic disease states is increasingly recognized as a driver of accelerated aging. So people with a uh, collection of disease states tend to uh, become frail quicker and to have many more uh, complications and die at younger age groups. So I won't spend a lot on this, but again, there's, there's been a lot of progress uh, around this wheel of, of basic uh, biologic aging. Uh, we focus mostly sort of on the left side of this, of mitochondrial changes, some senescent cell changes, and some stem cell changes seem to be most important or most uh, probably uh, closer to clinical translation at this point. And then so on to systems that drive frailty, we think again, energy metabolism and stress response systems really are at the heart of what we think of as frailty. And these have come through hundreds of studies at this point looking at these cha changes in these systems in various uh, populations and in animal models. So mitochondria, these little energy uh, generators that are located in cells, they produce energy, ATP, uh, and free radicals, and they're, again, most, in most cells of the body. And the poor clearance of damaged mitochondria as people age uh, tend to trigger more of these free radical, uh, more free radical production, which in, in turn can damage cells and, and set off a cascade of events. Um, we know that total uh, mass of mitochondria decrease with aging, so there's fewer of them around. They generate less uh, power. And again, they can also uh, generate excessive amounts of free radicals. Stress response systems that we think of are the inflammatory system, the innate immune system, uh, which, which drives inflammation, sympathetic nervous system, hypo thalamus, uh, pituitary adrenal axis, so HPA axis, and the renin-angiotensin system are some of the major systems that we work with. And these systems sh should get, for the most part, shut off when, when the stress is resolved. But what we see in a frail subset of people that these, uh, these systems are left on, maybe about a 25% volume. They're not turned full blast, like if somebody was uh, infected or had a uh, an injury, uh, uh, but they, and then they should be turned off when the, when the stress is resolved. But in, in general, in frail people, these, the volume is on in these uh, systems, and they, they tend to interact with each other and activate uh, the other systems. So what we see in frailty is that these systems, again, get turned on. They don't get shut off. They start activating other systems. And uh, this slide is sort of representative of the potential consequences. So all of these systems send out uh, mediators, uh, molecules that influence chronic disease, disability through skeletal muscle changes, depression, and cognitive decline, uh, and also very uh, specific tissue changes uh, across a broad range of tissues, uh, including um, skeletal muscle, brain tissue, um, and most, mostly in heart, heart tissue, mostly a sort of a fibrotic uh, tissue change late in life. So uh, if no fountain of youth, maybe fountain of resilience. That's, again, an, an emerging concept. And uh, we know that complex etiologies are different for different people. Diagnos diagnosis and treatment strategies will need to be individualized to these uh, very specific systems. And there is a very uh, a marked need for new diagnostic and therapeutic approaches that will target this underlying biology. We spend a lot of time working on that in the biologic discovery realm, uh, diagnostics to uh, help figure out 
uh, how, how best to detect differences between uh, individuals. Uh, again, like so mitochondrial uh, changes, we're, lo we're working on ways to find be better, better ways to find uh, um, abnormal mitochondrial changes. And then treatments targeting some of those biologic systems that I stated earlier. So I'll close with some tips for healthy, healthy aging. Again, a lot of this is, is, um, is gleaned from information that's come out over the last four or five years. It's certainly, um, again, not, not just one um, pathway that we're interested in. We're interested in impacting as many of these pathways as we can. And so you've heard a lot about nutrition and certainly uh, common sense eating with lots of uh, complex carbohydrates, especially uh, bright colored fruits and vegetables, and not too many calories is important. Exercise uh, has been shown to be effective in every, almost every study that's been done in humans from the, from the uh, young to the very old and very frail. There's lots of new knowledge about prevention of falls and injuries and also prevention of cognitive decline. We'll probably hear more about that later today. Uh, one thing uh, that was recently in the newspapers they found interesting, there's a, a runway model from China. It uh, uh, was a, a famous, I um, can't remember what his previous career was. It, he had a business career, but his recommendation was to keep trying new things, and he decided to become a, a runway model at age 80, and that's him on the stage there. So, um, But other tips in that regard, learn foreign languages. Even if you're really bad at it, it still, it still helps the brain. Study yoga, volunteer to tutor kids, volunteer in some kind of religious organization, explore spirituality, uh, improve computer literacy. All of those have had its studies around them and seem to help uh, long-term outcomes. Uh, we do have some information on healthy aging tips uh, on Twitter, and I will close and ask for questions. We'll take questions now. We have time for two or three. Uh, please use the floor mics if you can. Oh, out of your way. Enjoyed your talk. Um, I'm concerned that I'm going to be the last person to die a natural death. Is there a time horizon when, or, or a description you can give of where you see longevity? Um, nobody lives past 120 yeah, so, or something. So in general, 14? what we're seeing uh, in most of the aging studies is that, that in, the, in the past 30 or 40 years, so people were dying in their 70s uh, and uh, and early 80s, mostly of chronic disease states. And now as those are being increasingly treated, people are living more into their 80s and 90s. So in geriatrics practice now, instead of taking care of 75 or 80 year olds, we're taking care of um, 90 year olds and, and above mostly. So um, I think there is sort of a natural limit. It seems to be in the 90s to around 100. Um, so if people get through those disease states, they tend to kind of um, fade out at that state. And, and so again, our goal isn't to keep people alive forever, but it's to keep them healthy until they kind of reach that, that uh, natural state of, of dying. Hi, uh, Bonnie McLean. I'm a data analyst uh, at a small company, Data and Donuts, but we do big data analytics. And I'm curious if you're looking at any of the integration of health policy, health economics, along with the medical side to help drive some of these programs back into the community to improve um, senescence? Uh, so, so in the big data realm, we haven't done much uh, beyond um, sort of biologic data, looking at uh, genetic markers or, um, or sort of combining a broad um, interdisciplinary approach. But certainly people in our group in the Depart Division of Geriatric Medicine at Hopkins are working on those issues. and. Uh, uh, have access to several large databases uh, and are, are trying to figure out, uh, mostly based on Medicare claims data, uh, on how better to manage frail people, what kind of diagnoses they carry, and how to sort of keep them out of the hospital as much as possible. So there, there are people there, and I'd be happy to put you in touch with them. 